It's the extra meeting of the Social Services Committee. Uh, just like to remind everyone uh, present at this meeting will be recorded and the recording will subsequently be available for public listening. Uh, that's probably with the exception if we agree the exempt item at the end. Uh, Okay, can we move oh, yeah. can we move on to the set and apologies please? Morning. Chairman apologies from Councillor Hislop, Councillor Stitt, Councillor Tate and Councillor Tuckfield. Councillor Dick will be in later. I am I haven't seen Councillor Maitland. Uh, she's here but she's coming. Yeah. And Councillor McGregor's just and Councillor Thompson. I've arrived in. I'll need to do a recount now. We're core it though. We're core it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, move on to item three, the minute of the meeting of the 12th December. Have we agreed to true record? Thank you. Uh, move on to item four, the adult services review. It's a progress report. Um, uh, Jeff. Dean is uh, presenting this for us. Uh, basically, it's, it's an interim report, but uh, I think you'll need to come forward, Jeff, for the. Uh, Jeff, have you anything you'd like to add to this report? Any update or anything? Uh, thank you, Chair. The, the report is an interim report of uh, the review of adult social work services. Uh, back last year, we considered that we needed to make sure our adult services were fit for the future, considering the move to self-directed support, or personalization, and integration uh, of uh, health and social care. So uh, over the, the period since June last year, there has been a, a great deal of work undertaken to review uh, the services that we provide through adult care at the moment, we're at a point where we, we need to look at uh, options for the future, delivery of social work services to, to adults in Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, and that a further report will come back in uh, April to this committee. The options that we're looking at at the moment are uh, very much guided by the health and social care integration and personalization, as I've said. Uh, with really, we, we need to look at how we deliver adult services in localities uh, in conjunction with colleagues in health. So we'll look at each strand of uh, adult services, such as learning disability, physical disability, substance misuse, uh, mental health. So we'll, we'll look at each, we're, we're looking at each strand and considering how that is best integrated to protect and, uh, the vulnerable people within those categories that we work with. Um, as I say, the, a, full, a more detailed report would come back to April committee, but I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Jean? Chairman, we've got a, um, a very clear um, set of rules for running a service review uh, and I'm not completely clear about what stage we've got to and whether or not um, we've been consulted as we should have. There are four, uh, four times that we should be consulted as elected members, um, uh, either I think within or without committee, um, out with committee, um, and I'm not completely clear about where we've got to in this um, proposal. I, I certainly don't feel completely upsides with this review. And, and <clears throat> in an ideal world, um, Chairman, we should be um, clear about what's going on and, um, and be providing our input um, at each stage of the, the way. And uh, I have to say, I can't match um, this report uh, and where we've got to with the toolkit. I wonder if somebody could comment. Uh, right, okay, Jane, Jeff? Yes, thank you. We have uh, followed the service review toolkit. Um, the initial stage of 
consultation was about the decision to undertake the adult services review, which was taken back in June, Committee of Social Work Services. Uh, we are at the point where we, we've collected all of the information that we have about the service as it's delivered at the moment. And my understanding from the, 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 uh, the toolkit is that now we need to consult more widely, uh, as Councillor Maitland has said, uh, about the current situation and some of the options as we go forward. And that, that will be our next sort of step in the, the review. Happy, Jen? Well, <clears throat> when are we going to be consulted then as elected members? Because it's perfectly clear um, that you are to meet with the chair and the vice chair and each political group to inform about emerging findings. And that should be happening. And I don't think it's been happening and on a rolling basis. No, it hasn't happened as yet. As I say, that's the next step. It's, it's taken quite a long time to collect all of the information and, and to, to uh, really analyse that information so that we can uh, produce some of the, the findings and communicate those with the appropriate people and the appropriate elected members. Do you want back in, Jim? <clears throat> I think we need to have some idea of either timings um, about when we as elected members will be given that information or consulted or um, a, a promise to come back with that information? I, I think by definition, I don't want to answer for Jeff, but uh, if there's a paper coming back in April, it will be beaten now and the paper's written. I think there's a, a fair assumption to make, but I wouldn't like to assume that without asking Jeff. Yes, Chair, yeah, that's certainly the, the intention that there are rather than uh, just come back with the paper, that there are engagement groups uh, between now and that time before the paper is written. Thank you. Uh, Willie and then Ian. Yeah, Chair, I think that uh, Jane has said uh, mostly everything. You know, we've got a report here that, that quite frankly, I can see anything in it. So I can't, there is no detail. Jeff referred to it, we'll be coming back with more detail. Well, I don't see the detail in this one. Uh, that, that would give me any indication as to how and what is being improved. Uh, for example, I have been raising for a considerable time uh, homeless accommodation, uh, the, the standard ac or, or accommodation. I merely use as an example here, and yet, you know, the, there is nothing that would indicate what services we're looking at to improve, how they're going to improve, uh, and reference has been made that we asked for this in June 2013. And we're almost sitting in February 2014 with nothing here and nothing in this report that you could say, well, I can see improvement here or I know that's being reviewed and this is the improvement being made. I think, the, 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 you know, there is nothing in here, Chair, and we, we should be having detail on, on how it is uh, improving and what is uh, being looked at to improve. Uh, OK, your comments noted. Thanks, Ian. You answered the question earlier in regards to the April meeting, so I picked that was my question. Yeah. In that case, we we'll move to recommendations. Obviously, note the progress to date. We agreed. Note. I, 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 now, now, Mrs. Maitland. Right. Um, agree further reporting schedule. Okay, and. 2.3, note the arrangements for monitoring the implementation of the findings of the review, which are set out in the paper. Okay, thank you. Jane. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, actually. The more I come to think about it, um, uh, the, the less satisfactory I think this is. It's not adequate. The information in here does not, I think, fulfill the terms of the toolkit in terms of keeping members updated and uh, apprised of what is happening. Uh, I don't think it's satisfactory. I'm going to say the, 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 the note progress, um, but do not think it is satisfactory. With respect, Jane, we past 2.1, we agreed it. We're Sorry? 2.3 here. 2 .4. Okay, add 2.4. Add 2.4. Uh, receive, receive a report to the next committee detailing compliance with the service review toolkit. Fine, okay, I've taken advice, I'm happy to put a 2.4 in. Yeah, okay, so, Gail? Just for clarity, the next meeting's in about 
10, 11 days. So well, presumably we're looking past, at the April then. committee. Uh, are you honestly suggesting for about three weeks' time, Graham, two weeks' time? Yeah. 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 Brian first, yeah. Can, can I simply suggest that we add that on to a 2.2 .2 in terms of the detail, uh, agree further reporting schedule, as uh, we're so close to the next meeting, I would take a steer from officers as to whether it's feasible or not for that to come to the next uh, meeting, if it can be given to members between the next meeting and the following, then so be it. But we want a clear indication of what the reporting schedule is going to be and when the reports are going to be in compliance with the toolbox as soon as possible. Uh, I, I take your point, Brian, and, and it's well made. The problem we have is this is a, an extra meeting. Mm -hmm. um, if it doesn't come next meeting, um, the meeting it would come to is the one they're referring to in the paper. No, no I did say, Chair, uh, rather than wait after the next meeting till the following, if members could be advised of the, the information in the interim. I think that would right, be right, right. more satisfactory than waiting to till the following meeting. Okay, um, sorry, I misunderstood you, Brian. Yes, uh, Jane, are you happy with that? If we actually ask officers to contact the uh, the committee with the details of uh, how they've implemented the uh, the toolkit. I'm I'm quite happy. I'm just basically saying. <coughs> Um, I'm very happy with the, the, the deputy leader's proposals, yes, um, because I think that you have as an administration taken on board that this is not adequate. Um, six months ago, um, we decided to have a review and we've got a one and a half page report telling us nothing. Um, and uh, I don't like that. So I think the message has been taken on board. Okay, um, uh, we can arrange for that to happen. Brian, you went back in? Sorry, just to clarify whether or not it would be feasible for us to have a report by the next meeting, um, that's, that's the first question. If that's not feasible, then we go to the information being forwarded to us as soon as possible after that event. Okay, um, Jeff. Uh, the the issue here is about the detail that we have and the amount of information and the time it would collect take to collate that, which is what we're doing at the moment, it would be really difficult to meet the time scale for the next committee, which is, as you say, in a couple of weeks. But certainly that information and the adherence to the toolkit information could be made, made available to, to members outside committee cycle within uh, a few weeks. Um, mm. And that's certainly possible. So uh, would we be happy to amend 2.2 .2 to agree further reporting schedule and um, the, the receipt of further information about the toolkit uh, adherence uh, directly to members between the committee cycles or something down these lines, yeah? You happy with that? Yeah. Ian, are you were wanting in? Are you happy with that? Okay, thank you. Um, can you tell me what I've just agreed? <laughs> um, well, you're amending 2.2, .2, Chairman, that you will have further reporting schedule and that will as part of that, look at compliance with the toolkit, but you would like that information between before the next meeting um, in advance of that further report to the April meeting. So there will be a summary of that given to all members in advance of it being formally reported to committee. Okay, thank you. That's a positive way forward, I think, and uh, everyone's agreement. So I uh, can move to 2.3 then. Are we noting the arrangements for the monitoring the implementations of the finding of the review which are which are set out. Are we quite happy with that just now? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. We'll move on to item five, budget pressures. Um, Peter, I think you're taking us through, aren't it? No. Sean? Um, so we've got Sean and Peter, and Jeff. David and Jeff. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, Obviously, now this report is mainly for noting, but um, it will also inform the debate later on the agenda, I would suggest. Um, and, Sean, are you leading off, are you? Thanks, Chair. 
This report is brought forward in accordance with the agreed escalation process to alert members to two areas of significant budget pressure within children and families um, this year and the measures required by the service to alleviate these pressures uh, going forward. Um, two colleagues here are happy to answer any service related questions and I can answer any finance related questions. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Jock. Thanks, Chair. <coughs> it's just on, on paragraph 4.9, we recognise there's pressures on the youngster, the budget for the youngsters. But you're on about the number of moving out of the, uh, they're becoming 18, so they'll then move out of this budget. I thought we had a responsibility up to about 21 or 25. So on that basis, they're either, if they're moving out of the youngster's budget, they're moving into somebody else's budget, and that, is that budget capable of catering for these youngsters? Because some of them need support, and some of them are maybe ready to move on. Just on that basis, what's the position regarding budget? Peter, you picking up that? Rowney, is another card we can put in? Yeah, because I can... You, you can put one in, can you? Yeah, give me two seconds and then I'll get another card to save this. Musical chairs. Okay, and we're going to have to share the one we have then, because um, it needs to be recorded. You turn it on, Peter, yeah. There are currently um, six young people in their 17th year, in fact. Um, I believe one's already turned 18 just recently. Um, these are, we do have a statutory responsibility for children that have been looked after up to the age of 21, and that's in terms of um, keeping um, an eye on their welfare and promoting their development. So it's not a question of a young person <coughs> turning 18 and we have no more to do with them. Um, and that's up to 21 currently in the new children's, uh, children and young persons bill that responsibility will be extended up to the age of 25. Um, and that will include a responsibility to, where necessary, accommodate young people in the way that, that um, a parent <coughs> might. Um, <clears throat> all these young, the, the, the three young people that are turning the age of 18 um, will all have special needs. Um, at least two of them that I'm aware of will require support from the learning um, disabilities budget and that will um, in all likelihood put, put some pressure on that budget. Um, so it's not a question of the young person turns 18 and they're on the street. Um, we'll all, we also work closely with um, housing and with homelessness services to ensure um, that, that those young people that, that are able to look after themselves are accommodated. Um, in suitable properties and those that uh, require additional support and help might either go into a hostel or into home park. Brian, the same question, Brian, yeah? Just on the same point, yeah, I think uh, Councillor McKee was asking why it was aged 18. Uh, I, I know I would like to understand the reason why the age 18 and the distinction between that and age 21, just for clarity. That's a distinction in law. Um, a young person who's on a, a home supervision order 
is deemed to be a child in the eyes of the law until that home supervision order ends and then become an adult. Um, if they're not on a home supervision order or a, a, a court order, they would become an adult at 16. Okay, Brian. Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, Richard. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I think I raised this last meeting. The uh, question is about Hardthorne Road. When will it be? When will it be open? When will it be working to capacity so that we can realise the savings we we budgeted for? I still think I feel in the dark about this project. I don't know if other members share that feeling. Uh, last meeting you said it was under under investigation, but I have no idea what this investigation entails. Is it an internal disciplinary matter? Is it a dispute with the contractor? Is it a wrangle with the past owners? I'm not sure perhaps you could give some at least general information without revealing confidentiality. What's going on there? And also, it mentions in the last page of the report, page 20, I note too that there will be a staff cost budget increase of £350,000 there. Uh, was that part of the business plan when we decided to go ahead with Hardthorn Road? Because we have to we get that income, for, we have to make that money before we make any budgets, budget savings on, on, on this. So a bit more detail about what's happening there and an a, a answer on the, the business plan for that. Uh, okay, fair enough. Um, on the first issue, um, the investigation is complete. The results of that investigation are currently with the head of the service or the different strands of the council involved in it. So therefore, it's still an ongoing process. So um, the officers rightly can't uh, discuss that here today. Um, as for the rest of the, the, the business plan and the time scales and things like that, uh, Peter, can you give us a, a steer on that, please? I can indeed, chap. Um, Hartthorne Road is open. Um, in terms of the building, the, we've had to recruit a temporary um, unit manager for up to a period of 12 months because the, team mani uh, the unit manager that was there took out of retirement under Rule 85. Nothing that, that, that could be done about that. The um, staff team have now been recruited and are being um, inducted and taught and able to work as a group. And in fact, um, we're actively um, considering the admission of a young person there over the next week or so. We've also looked through the current um, cohort of young people in agency placements. Um, and as I speak, the manager that's responsible for overseeing admissions to the fostering system and to um, residential care is consulting with team managers um, about the suitability of young people um, for Hardthorne Road. It's not a question of, I mean, they're not widgets, young people, and we can't suddenly disrupt one placement and say, right, it suits the council economically, therefore you'll move. Um, so any, any move of a young person from an agency placement into Hardthorne Road is something that will have to be done very sensitively. Um, we've also got to bear in mind um, the mix of a group in Hardthorne Road and the relative immaturity of that staff team. So the, 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 the process of moving young people, getting the mix of young people right, and getting the developing and building the skills of the staff team are, are critical factors. That is not to say um, that there's any lack of um, drive in terms of occupying that building. It should be occupied now, it isn't. Um, I'm disappointed about that, um, and I'm doing everything that I can to ensure that there will be, um, that it will be occupied within the next um, period of time. But I can't give you a guarantee about that and I can't give you um, definite dates about that because as I say, that it, it, it is about professional judgments and about matching young people to suitable places. Richard, you went back in. Yeah, perhaps the finance uh, personnel can comment on the on the business case which I mentioned, yeah. whether was it in the business case, and, per, and to go back and going back to the investigation, uh, without going revealing any confidentiality, was it what prompted the investigation in general terms? If you can't say it in the public session, perhaps you'd like to 
mentioned it at the end of the meeting in private. We resolved to go into private. Uh, but, yeah. Um, I'll answer it, yes, because I was uh, concerned, as the chair, a number, a number of significant items, and I was also aware that it was not a social work only issue, it was a cross council issue, and the only way to deal with it was actual fact was to get the proper officer to, to mount a full investigation across the council to make sure that A, we get it right the next time round, and um, and we learn the lessons from this one, and uh, and that's exactly what's done. Uh, that's what they've done, and I would suggest the longer they've taken actually means uh, the complexity of the investigations they undertook, rather than any um, wish to delay that process. Um, I hope that's that's answered that question. Was there a question in the second part? Uh, just just that it's an internal investigation rather than an ex as well as external. No, it's um, it's an internal investigation because all the problems uh, that were that were coming to light were internal council problems, and um, I can't really go into the, the, all the different things. But they, what they came to eventually was um, how can I put this? It wasn't quite a dog's dinner, but it was getting close to that at one stage. And I think we needed to um, draw con draw it to a conclusion get all the facts because what was happening is we were just picking little bits up from different parts um, and the the proper the proper review has done that um, and it's currently with the heads of the service uh, that were involved to look and see um, if it's uh, the proper or the appropriate way forward all right yes Gail I mean, I, I've sat on this committee for seven years now, and this has been an ongoing Horlicks for a long, long time. And members have not been informed at any point along the way as to what is being done or any outcomes. And I would suggest that whether it be through this committee or through full council, that we do have a, a good exempted report taken in private to inform members. We, we do it with every other situation, whether it be DG1 or um, PPPs or whatever. And I, and I think at this stage, in this process, this facility still isn't being maximised and used properly. Um, and as I say, we've been discussing this for years. I think members need to understand what went wrong and we need to take a report in private at some point at the appropriate committee. Uh, we, we, we can't, we, uh, with the greatest respect, Gil, we can't actually have that here because it's a, it's a matter for the head of paid service because it is an operational issue. Operationally, things weren't as they should have been. Right? What we will get at the end of it is the outcome, yeah, um, and I think that's fair and reasonable. Um, but at this moment in time, it has to be free from political interference, and I use that word advisedly, right? Okay, um, the, uh, the investigation has to be allowed to, be, to continue, has to allow it to finish, and uh, we need closure on this and move forward. Okay, um, R Richard, I'm getting back to your original question. You had an issue, a second question in there, I think. Yeah, it was a question on, there's mention of £350,000 extra staffing being needed at Hearthland Road. Was that part of the original business case for, for going ahead with it? Sean, do you know? Uh, yes, the, the original budget assumption was that um, Hearthland Road would be met from within social work existing resources. Therefore, the, the, the process or the plan to find the 350k required would be a transfer from the agency placements budget be, and the assumption was that two children would move from agency placements which cost in, a, in the region of 350k that money would move across and those children would be hosted in Hearthorn Road and that was the budget assumption. Okay I've got Willie, Brian and any Ian Carruthers. Thank you Chair. Chair I'm surprised that we've not got any uh, reference to kinship care in this uh, report. I'm dealing with this in terms of prevention for agency placements. I do look at 6.4 where it says intensive fostering service as it uh, continues to develop will offer other options for children and young people which will support the reduction in the use of agency placements. Will similarly kinship care and carers then reduces the need for if you like, uh, agency placements, should those children go through panel or whatever and then have to be put to agency. My understanding is that there is a budget pressure in kinship carers to the point where some kinship carers are not being paid just now. 
because of the budget pressure. And if uh, it was decided that th those children uh, or, or the kinship carer was unable to look after that child, uh, and I'm not suggesting anything in that, but if it was decided that it could end up an agency placement in similar to that of foster carers. And what I'm looking for is, yes, there is, I understand there is a budget place, uh, pressure on kinship carers, but we should be making that payment to kinship carers as there have been reports before this committee in the past, and we agreed to, to make those payments, but we now seem to reach that point. It's the budget pressure, but uh, it's the impact that would have on other parts of the budget if we don't make those payments. And I want your assurance, Chair, that we will make those payments backdated to when the, the individuals did take responsibility for kinship carers. I'm looking for your assurance here, Chair. Uh, you'll get my assurance we'll do that outside the meeting, Willie, because that's not the agenda item. Um, thanks for your statement, though. No. Brian, you're next. Thanks, Chair. I don't believe there is a pressure uh, or a backlog in kinship uh, payments. However, I'm going to page 20 and note one. I am some, in something of a quandary on the last two lines and my ability to understand what's actually been said there. Children at an average cost of 150k per annum for six months of the year without increasing the current budget staff cost. Does that mean 75,000 or could somebody please explain it to me? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Brian. Um, who is it? Okay. Uh, Sean? The, the budget assumption at the start of the year was that Hartland would be open and available to accommodate two children for six months of the year. Based on an average cost of 150k per annum, which for six months is 75k times two children, we expected two children to be in with the current staffing complement that was available. Thank you. I went round the hills to understand that one, but I uh, appreciate it. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Ian Crothers? Actually, I had a couple of questions. One's been answered in regards to the agency placement. I suppose one, one I could just tie in the back of that. Agent, I've worked out the agency placements going by the figures that have been uh, within the report. shows I think it's about 177,285 per placement per annum for each kid. That's what it costs, roughly. Uh, it's... Through Hartford Road, will we, will we see a saving there? I think, well, can do we see a saving through that because it's not an agency placement? And at 4.7 in particular, when it, and it refers to the sheriff in particular rather than the children's panel, how much of a real pressure actually is that for the council? Um, right. Uh, Peter, can you lift that or is it Sean? Well, if I, I'd take the one about the, the sheriff's call. Um, we, I mean, and these are unexpected. I mean, I. I, I can't go into um, detail because it would be confidential and uh, even if I referred in general terms to particular young people, um, it would be possible to identify them. But if a young person, for example, um, is arrested on a, a serious charge um, and, wants, and the sheriff is of a mind that that person um, should not be um, in the community, then we're faced with the choice of either looking for a, a young person to be remanded in prison, age 16, 17, or looking for um, what's, what's termed a place of safety, um, which is generally a secure unit, which is generally very, very expensive. Our statutory duty um, is to um, put the needs of the young, child, the young person as paramount and behave as a good parent would. So that's where the pressure comes from, where a, a, a sheriff considers it unsafe either for that young person or for the community, for that young person to be at liberty. Um, and so we're placed in the position then of having to identify um, an expensive placement in order to fulfil our, our, our duties as a good parent. It's an up particular question for myself. It's as much about the how often does that happen? Is that six times a year, once every three years? It, it happens infrequently, but when it happens, it's expensive. I mean, it's happened two or three times this year. Two or three times this year. Okay, and I should know. add that um, the most recent one lasted for a very, very short period of time. The, the other question, maybe I have shown me pick up. In relation to whether Hartland Road would deliver a saving, would de depend on 
all circumstances going in our favour, in effect, four current agency placements that we are paying for, probably, you know, the, the average from 135k a year up to 265k a year. So say they were, it would depend where they fell in that range, whether a, a saving was achieved. The budget assumption is that two out of region agency placements going to Hartland Road. So if it could be more than two, then that would give the, you know, that budget a bit more scope. But as, as Peter says, uh, they're not widgets and there's special circumstances for people to be able to uh, reside in Hartland Road. Sure. Sure. I uh, just I'd like to add a little bit to that, Chair, that although we're talking about the, the cost of agency pl pl placement, there's also a human cost. And I mean by that, as Peter says, we need to be good parents. And part of being good parents is, is keeping local children within their local uh, com com community so they can access their, their local schools, their, their, lo their local friends. So it's just not about the, the, the financial Im impact, it's about the cost to that child as well. That is important that they're kept in their community. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that, and, and, and would, again, I would support that. It just, it's probably a lot of my questions over the next few months will be in regards to getting a clear understanding on how, how the social work services work. Willie and then John Martin. Yeah, you, <coughs> if you allow me to come back, uh, as you seem to just skip over that uh, on, on your uh, remarks, I did. Uh, okay, note excuse that me, you, Willie, if it's about kinship care, we agreed at the last yeah. council it's coming forward at a separate meeting from this. Sure. And it's not really appropriate. I, it's not in the papers. It's not here for discussion. And it's no fair to ask officers to comment today on what you or others might think may be, and I'll use the word maybe, a budget pressure. You might be right. You might be wrong. It's unfair to ask officers to comment on that. And it will be coming forward in the very near future. I right? wonder if so it's something to, different uh, than that, yes, come in. I, it's, I, I did make the point, Chair, that, that I was surprised that wasn't, there was not a narrative on, on kinship carers, as indeed there is on foster, uh, uh, fostering, because it does have a, 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 a budget pressure, as indeed those who, who do the, the, the fostering uh, services. But it is on that uh, whether people believe or don't believe, then what I am asking is, and, and, and you've confirmed it, that there is a report uh, brought back to this committee, and I'm happy to accept your assurance uh, out with this that, that kinship carers are uh, being paid uh, and paid appropriately with, with back date. Uh, I will accept that assurance from you at the, uh, at the end. But it's no matter who believes and who doesn't believe, we need that report, and I'm pleased to say that it's coming forward, and I would hope it can forward at the April meeting. Actually, I think the words of you were, were may or may be, or maybe not, right? Oh, so I didn't actually say didn't believe. I, I, Chair, it was said that the, the, the remark was made by a, another member that said, I did not believe. That's what was said. Uh, we'll just move on because I'm, I'm no for uh, that sort of pedantics here. Too, too many important things to get through. Um, John, Martin? It's just a wee bit, of, maybe a bit pedantic here, but in 411, it's got when they turn 18 through the use of facilities such as the home park. Should that not read home park view? As I think the only facilities at the home park is some waterlogged football pitches. <coughs> It, it, it should indeed. Okay, points made. Anyone else? Okay, in that case, then we'll move to the recommendations at 2.1. Um, we note the two budget pressures uh, facing social work, respective agency placements in children with disabilities, and the measures um, that have been taken to control these, uh, the areas of spend. Uh, have we agreed? Yeah. Yep. 2.2. Um, Pressures we consider as part of the reviews to refer to in section 7.6, which will inform the social work budget. Yeah, yeah great. And 2.3, note the shift in service provision and practice to early intervention prevention as set out in section 6. Noting. Thank you. Jane, you want in? Uh, and remind me about when we are actually going to receive information about Hartthorne Road. Just remind me about what has been decided. Um, we will get the information on Hardthorn Road as elected members when the entire uh, investigation and any actions that, re that result from that are completed because it is purely an operational matter and a, well, it needs to come to us, I would suggest, for no uh, as a noting report but, and uh, also consideration of any strategic um, uh, recommendations we might want to make or take or, or um, look at the processes that are currently in place and how we can do it. I'm not opening up again, Dick, because if it's on the same subject, we've, we've, we've passed that. 
What is it? Yeah, is it the same thing? It's a brief comment. It's operational, as you say, but as as uh, gardens of this project, we've got a right to scrutinise it and exactly know what's going wrong. And I think we need to know exactly what went wrong here as as the guardians of this project. Uh, 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 we are uh, uh, guarding the public person and we need the full information. No one is denying you the right to scrutinise once the process is complete. You can't scrutinise a half-finished process. Uh, that in itself is poor scrutiny. So can we move on from that, yeah? 2.3, are we agreeing the shift in provision and practice the early intervention and prevention as set out in Section 6? We note that, yep. Thank you very much. We'll move on to Item 6, uh, the scrutiny for the budget proposals. Uh, I think uh, Matthew Healy's taking us through this. Um, again, this is a free scrutiny of the proposed savings, and uh, it's the final cog in the consultation process, I think. Matthew? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll just take a few minutes to introduce the report, if, if that's OK. Um, the report pulls together a number of areas relevant to the social work budget in 2014-15. Uh, as members will be aware, full council meets on 6th of February to agree the council's budget for that year. And in advance of that meeting, this report summarises proposed savings and proposed policy development money specifically related to social work. Appendix 3 to the report provides details of the four specific areas where, as a service, we are committed to generating efficiencies during 2014-15. These areas have been developed and debated by the Social Work Senior Management Team and subject to substantial independent scrutiny prior to being published here as a formal proposal. I'd be happy to discuss areas in more detail, Chair, but I believe that the members will be aware of, of each of the, the areas that are mentioned. For example, members will recall the presentation that was provided at the committee in December on care package reviews. Appendix 4 to the report details the policy development funding, uh, specifically in relation to the care at home sector. And again, Chair, members will be aware of the, pre the pressures that we as a council face in sustaining a viable care at home market. And this proposed funding provides a service with additional resources to be used to sustain that market. And if agreed, the use of that funding would be informed by the review work that is currently being progressed within the service. That's probably all I'd like to say, Chair, so I'd be happy to take any questions. OK, I'm, I'm aware this is the administration's uh, draft budget, and uh, it's up for part of the consultation process here, I would suggest. And uh, I don't think we should actually... We can ask the questions we want, but we don't want to take the place of full council next week as the budget proposals go forward. So any other budget proposal not included in this, I don't think is actually really what we should be discussing today. Um, so I just moved to questions in actual fact. Yep. Ian? Okay, well, if this is an appropriate question, I know that just in regards to what's been proposed with the home care uplift, it's just, I mean, I'm interested at, at, at this level, how we look at, how we monitor, how that performs, how it bears out, how we, we, how we can understand from the committee perspective how we're sustaining that within the community, because that's as much as anything about sustaining the, the, the private stroke third sector uh, delivering that service. How do we look at, uh, monitor that, Chair? Okay, Matthew? Well, I, I think in, in home care, obviously, it is a, it's a very complex area in, in general. And the, the monies that have been made available here are in relation to the fact that we haven't provided an uplift within the home care market for a, a number of years. The provision of that money needs to be separated from what we will do with that money. And, and, and this proposal is simply about making that money available. How that money is made available to the, the sector will be informed by the, the current care at home review, which has been undertaken at present. So, so Obviously, within that, we are looking at the overall sustainability of that market, our use of home care market, our use of other um, alternative uh, early intervention and prevention methods as, as well, in order that overall we can keep people safe at home. I don't know if that quite... It does, but I suppose the point I'm trying to pick up in particular, the obvious one is to, th to think of is, is a company going, going, going out of business. Ken, it's part of that thing as well. Just it's, it's make sure that we're, as a committee, we're aware of that. If anything like that's starting to happen, and, and the, Ken, the sector out there is starting to crumble, we need to be 
needs to be highlighted. And is, is this amount enough is probably what I'm driving at. I, I think the argument out there in the big wide world would be it's never going to be enough. Um, whatever the increase would be, they would still suggest they needed more. Um, and again, that may be right and it may be wrong. Uh, but this is the building block they allow us to take forward the outcome of the, the, the care at home review. Because without this building block, you know, if the review comes up with something, then we have we immediately got a budget pressure. So this budget development actually allows that uh, that development to take place. And let's let's be frank here, uh, that sector hasn't had an uplift for some number of years, as as Matthew says, and that's clearly no right either. Uh, how it's applied will be driven by the the care at home review. I think the general suggestion, am I right? It was made about, like I say, more than the actual. Make sure it's it's stable. It's the the, the organisations are sustainable. It's like I come back to December, the, the budget meeting, my group said absolutely, we were absolutely behind this and fully supported it. So no questioning the fact that it's there or, or criticising in any way. Just how does this come out then monitor the fact that, that it's, uh, it's, it's being affected? Uh, Matthew, yeah. I, I, I think uh, as an ongoing uh, process through our commissioning and contracting and quality assurance teams, we, we do monitor the overall sustainability of the market we meet with providers on a regular basis um, in sort of open forums with, with all providers and on one-to-one -one basis. So, so through that, we are constantly getting information about the sustainability and, and any problems that are, are coming through. I think, as the Chair says, home care, it's a, it's a national issue at, at the moment, and, and we could, no matter what resources you put into it, you, you know, the, the market could, could absorb those resources. And I think one of the challenges that we've got through the home care review is, is looking at this not, not only in terms of the, the price of buying an additional hour of home care, but also the overall demand and how we can sustain the market overall with, with, by, by um, not, not only thinking about price, but, but thinking about what other alternative provision we, we can put in place in order to um, minimise the, 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 the pressures on, on that market. So through recruitment, retention and, and training and, and, and so on and so forth as well. So, so we are, through that review, taking a, a, a holistic review, if, if you like, of, of that overall market. I, I think also to partly answer your question, Ian, that this was partly driven by representations from the sector, um, you know, with financial pressures on them. So um, uh, they've been listened to and, uh, and referred to. Now, I've got a number of people wanting in here. I've got uh, Gail, Jane and then Brian, I think. Thank you, Chair. With your indulgence, it's just um, I got a little bit lost in the discussion there because I was looking at template 19 at Appendix 3. Can we take them in order so that we all know where we're at? I didn't realise we'd moved on to policy development. Uh, OK. Um, I'm also not wanting to rehearse next week's full council meeting, but uh, yes, we can have free and frank discussion. OK. Right, OK. Matthew? So would you like to repeat the question for Matthew? It's not a question, I was just asking if we can take the appendixes, the templates in order as they are in the book, because we seem to move on to policy development before we've discussed Appendix 3 and the templates 19, 20 and so forth. Yeah, I'm quite happy to go that, down that route. Okay, appendix by appendix. Okay, so we start with Appendix 3. Any questions, Appendix 3? Yeah. On, on page 19, yeah. The number 19. So it's page 29, 120, yeah. Template 19, sorry, yeah. Richard? Yeah, I've got a few questions on whether these sa savings are achievable. I just want an assurance that uh, we can achieve the, the savings in that one, the, the, in, in the block contract. Simple answer, I think, is, is, is yes on, on that. I mean, the, these proposals, all, all of them have been debated fully by Social Work Senior Management Team. They've been informed by work that has been ongoing in thirteen fourteen, and um, they, they are what, at this stage, we believe to be achievable during 2014-15. Clearly, things may change, but at this moment in time, we believe all of these proposals to be achievable. From, from the budget lead's point of view, I can give the assurance that they were thoroughly 
uh, scrutinised and, de and debated with the senior te management team of social work, um, and certainly the budget leads are satisfied that uh, these are achievable. Yeah, it's a similar question to, to that. The last and the answer is likely yes, because the, the senior management team has, has discussed it, so it's able to be delivered. When I look at, uh, there are around 525 people in the care packages, and we're looking at high cost packages here. And the intention is, you know, uh, in 2014-15, uh, on the gross savings and then agency staff, minus that, uh, a £375,000. What's the net effect, uh, you know, of, of, of taking that kind of on the high cost packages, given there's 525 people, uh, you, you know, and, and some are a, a thousand plus, some are four thousand, some are down to 500. What's the net effect? What, what effect will, will will this have in, in taking that amount of money out of the budget? Uh, and you know, it's so that we don't reach a point where senior managers are saying, "Yes, we can," uh, uh, and someone suffers as a result. Uh, to their detriment. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Scobie. Hey, uh, before I let Matthew in to talk more about the, the, the financial qu question, I think it's going back to a uh, social work and the social work practice uh, issue. And I'd like to take this opportunity to assure a uh, com committee that in carrying out this process, that we are not going to leave vulnerable uh, children, adults at risk, uh, because if we did do that, then we wouldn't be doing our job as social workers. Uh, but under early intervention and uh, prevention, uh, we have got to look at how we best use our resources. A uh, committee heard from uh, a presentation at last uh, com com committee where we need to be using modern technology such as telecure, uh, sort of to, to improve pe pe people's lives. One of the things that's been identified through um, the review of care packages is the the overnight issue where, where somebody stays with somebody o overnight. Now, we can put technology in there now that uh, makes the person feel a lot more comfortable, a lot more safer, because there's, no, there's nobody else in the house. But going back to my original point is, is uh, going through this process, we are not going to leave anybody at risk. So I'll hand back to, to, to Matthew for the more financial part of that question. Thanks, Sean. I mean, I suppose the only thing that I would add to that is, is that we're not removing budget from, from anyone in, in carrying out this work. The savings that, that we're anticipating here will only be delivered at the, commence, or at the completion of the, the, the reviews. The, the, the figure here is our best estimate at the moment based on what we've achieved during 2013-14 and, and, and based on a planning work for 2014-15 of what we can achieve at the, commence, at, at the completion of those reviews, but it will only be delivered, as, as members will recall from, from the presentation in December, only be delivered if, if social work practice determines that that can be delivered. So it, this is not a financial-led uh, process here, and the 375 is only an estimate of, of what we believe can be delivered, rather than a budget reduction. Thanks, Matthew. Will you want to come back? I mean, just to say, I'm reassured by both Sean's answer and, and, and the officer's answer in terms of uh, the, the, the impact they affect and how it's to be carried forward, uh, and particularly to other methods of delivering the service. I must say, I'm, I'm delighted because only uh, uh, to the same period that's being referred to then it was we were going to bring the budget, the social work budget into line to last year's 1314. I'm delighted that, uh, that the overspend has been recognised. Uh, you, you did remark that, we, that there's more needed. Indeed, there is more needed in social work to deliver uh, the needs-led budget. Uh, and there is not an increase in terms of uh, the budget as to how it was spent in 1415, uh, or rather 1314 for 1415. And I'm uh, reassured by the answer given that no one w w will be put at risk uh, and it will not be to the detriment of the services we deliver. No, I think your point's um, made, Willie. And uh, I mean, this is an example of best practice in terms of professional uh, professionalism in, in, in professional social work. 
and also the business administration and monitoring side is, is on the ball here. And um, I think they should be commended for it. Um, but, but I think that's what you were saying. Um, uh, Ian Crothers. Thank you. This one came up quite a few times uh, in regards to being questioned at the four area budget consultation meetings, area committee budget consultation meetings. And the answer that we got at that point was this was as much about looking at care packages that had been put in place and it was they were subject to review. They hadn't been, been, been actually getting reviewed. That's the answer we're getting there. So I would imagine it would be the, that's consistent. Is that consistent with the answer we've just received in Alfred ourselves? It was as much about that and there was a saving would be found through that uh, process. Yeah. He, Councillor, I think the simple answer is yes. <laughs> you know, there's, there's not very much to, to say. Like you say, packages needed to be due to make sure that people were getting the right service at the, the right time. And we found out that that's been a, a, a saving, but still keeping people safe from their own homes, which is a, a totally one of our principles. Th th thanks, Sean. Uh, Ian Dick. Thanks, Chair. I think I think what was was apparent since the Price Waterhouse Cooper um, uh, audit report and uh, uh, subsequent discussions, um, budgetary discussions with the senior uh, management team was <coughs> that when these many of these uh, packages were put in place, they were put at the time of the highest uh, um, emergency, if you like. Uh, there was a crisis point, and they were put in place to reflect that crisis point. What was entirely unacceptable was the fact that they never re were reviewed. And we continued spending large quantities of money when the, the need um, had declined. So it's only been right and appropriate that this program of reviews uh, takes place because uh, a lot of that money being spent where it's actually not needed anymore um, is required elsewhere. So I think this was one of the more welcome aspects of the, the budgetary process. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, in that case, we'll move on to. Sorry, sorry, Jane, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Chairman, uh, we're being asked to scrutinise these uh, savings, and um, I have no doubt at all. We're now on to number 22, I think, which is the staffing. 20 You're going on to 21. Beg your pardon. Beg your pardon. I'll come back. OK. Um, we're moving on. To anyone else on template 20? We'll move on to template 21 then, the intensive fostering. Richard? Yeah, I think the development of this service is to be welcomed. It's a good step forward, but uh, I just want to know the sustainability and whether we can we can achieve these £300,000 savings. Uh, these assume that, that the challenging individuals which the intensive foster care Packages are going to be 100% successful all the time. Is that the, is that the perception in the past that, that these have been 100% successful in the past? Because the, we are working with challenging individuals and there is a, there's a degree of risk that they, they won't always be successful and they have to be returned to placements. Councillor, I, I think I'd be very naive of myself if, uh, to stand up here and give an assurance that the, the intensive fostering scheme would be 100% successful, right? Uh, it is a scheme that has been successful. Uh, there will always be, we'll always have to find the right match of a placement for each child. But one of the things with intensive fostering is going back to what I said about Hartthorne Road. It's about trying to keep a child within its local community and local support networks. Now, the, the question, probably should be more about what is the difference between intensive fostering and ordinary fostering. Uh, within an ordinary foster, no, there's no such thing as an ordinary fostering situation, but within a, a normal fostering situation, uh, parents get on with their own lives, they hold down jobs and stuff. With intensive fostering, this is their job. So they're able to give more time, more support, and more com 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 commitment to what is a, a our most vulnerable children. So, 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 but, but I couldn't say here today that it would be 100% success, but we are going to make it as successful as we can. Okay, um, Gail. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I mean, this is obviously a very valuable service, particularly for the, the vulnerable young people that are involved within it. 
Um, the saving itself is greatly dependent on a huge number of variables. Um, the matching, as you say, um, you know, whether the discretion of the children's <coughs> hearing, um, whether they want other people placed, so that, that there is a huge pressure on this that it won't be achievable because there's so many variables that are almost out with social work's control. And it's just picking up on the bit there, it says it's our intention to recruit additional intensive foster carers. And then right at the bottom, it says, based on the foster care complement we currently have within the region, you almost have enough. So they're sort of contradicting themselves that you're needing more foster carers, but we actually have enough foster carers. And it was just sort of clarity on that. And how do you recruit foster carers for, you know, for information? Um, particularly in this sort of intensive area, and how do you, you know, do, do you have enough people within region who are interested in taking up these positions? Okay, Gail, <laughs> I'll try and capture everything. Uh, first of all, it's uh, about the the fostering. Uh, we have enough foster parents to 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 meet the the normal day-to-day -day demand, okay? Uh, we, at the minute, we've got to recruit to the foster parents who are going to fit this category of in, in, intensive fostering. Now, for me to tell you how to uh, how we recruit foster parents would probably be a seminar with, with it in its own, own right. Uh, but very basically, what, what ha ha happens is any in, individual in the community can write to our family pl placement team and say, I want to be assessed as a foster parent. They will then go through um, a series of what we, of what we call a uh, preparation groups where we, we actually prepare people to what it's like to actually um, be, be a, fo a fo fo foster parent. Uh, at the end of that process, uh, <laughs> Throughout the process, they, they will have an allocated social worker from the family placement team. Uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the preparation process, they then move into the social worker doing what they call a Form F, which, which is a, like a profile of, of that particular foster parent. And w within that, um, they would actually look at um, where those individual skills are best met. Are they best met with uh, younger children? Uh, older children, uh, then when that process is finished, right, uh, it's got to go before uh, our, our, our fostering panel, uh, which then would, would at the end of that would say, yes, uh, this person is fit to, to look after some of our most vulnerable. Now, within all of that, right, uh, there's, there's medical checks, there's police checks, uh, we do medical checks uh, because we've got to make sure that, that somebody is is physically fit to do the job as have, as well as having that mental strength as well. It it is a a big big ask that, that we all we ask of our foster parents. So, yeah, as, if, if there's any more, I can get our family placement team manager to come and speak to you if, or any any of the groups. To, no, it's it's not specific. It's just in relation to the achievability of the yeah. saving um, and and sort of the knowledge that we do have capacity within the region who are willing to step forward and do a more intensive form of fostering, yeah. or whether we're actually going to find that we only have two or three, and then it truly falls short of that savings target. Um, but I think you've given the reassurance that we don't have a huge issue with with getting foster carers in Dumfries and Galloway. People are keen to do it, and that's great. Um. Thanks, Gail. Uh, Sean, I think I'm right. We're actually getting adverts prepared just now for into foster care. Am I right? I I believe so. But I'd also like to put in, <coughs> put in another plug in here, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, just prior to uh, Christmas, our family placement team uh, got an unannounced uh, inspection from, from from the care in, 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 in inspection, and we were very very pleased uh, with the outcomes of that report because we've got goods and very goods. Uh, so just put that in. <laughs> okay, thank you. Is there anyone else on uh, template 21? No. In that case, we'll move to template 22. Staffing structure. Uh, Jane, you want it in, I think? Um, yes, it's a sort of general point, actually. I mean, but I was going to discuss template 22. Um, we're being asked to scrutinise these savings, I think, 
with respect to whether or not they're achievable. I think that's what we're being asked to do. Not whether they're a good idea or whether they're a bad idea, it's whether they're achievable. And um, I, I have no particular difficulty with any of the proposals. It's a, it's a more general issue, is that um, when we look at measures uh, to reduce or address risks, it's very slender in all of these um, templates. It's very, very little um, um, telling us you know, what the risks are and, and what we're going to do about it. I mean, I've been on the website and looked at the impact assessments. I've looked at those, uh, and they're actually <coughs> not tremendously um, informative either. But um, I was particularly interested with respect to um, um, the template 22, and I'm quite happy to discuss this under... The, you know, the report dealing with staffing, if you want to do it like that, um, because I think there are specific issues <coughs> to do with. It says on page 38, for example, that the achieving of this saving would involve staff working in new ways and taking on new, though appropriate, roles and responsibilities, including frontline professionals having greater discretion in delivering services. Now, I, I, I'm nothing wrong with that. I think that's a really, really good thing. Um, but, you know, there is no suggestion as to when you go on to measures to reduce risks, uh, we're going to have an action plan on I identified emerging risks will be developed as the process unfolds. And, Chairman, you know, that doesn't just absolutely fill me with confidence. I think, is that, is that a statement, Jane, actually, rather than a question? Well, <laughs> if, if I'm being asked about the 200,000, I don't have a problem with that. And this is really why I was asking you whether I should be scrutinising this particular saving now um, with respect to the 200,000 and the risks attendant, or whether you want me to look at it as part of the next, the next um, um, committee paper. It's in the other agenda item. I think we, we can come to that later if you want. I think it might be a better place to do okay. it. And, and okay, if, if, um, if that's... I, I, I'm easy with that. I, I, can, I can live with either way. So, um, Unless you want to discuss it just now, and then that means we don't have to discuss it in the next agenda item. But uh... <laughs> Okay, then, and we'll leave it at that. Um, can we then look at Appendix 4? Um, are we quite comfortable with the, what has been... Uh, Ian? Yeah. Suppose, I mean, the question I was going to ask in regards to the, the previous part was what, what is the correlation between the two, between the Appendix 22 and the, the further on agenda item? But we can pick it up at that point. It, it, I was going to pick up on that though. It's 200k there identified. Is it, I take it there is a clear cor correlation between the two. Uh, absolutely. We'll, we'll, we can discuss that uh, when we come to the, the structure paper. Um, no, I'm just moving on to uh, Appendix 4 and page 41. Uh, uh, is there anything here? Because uh, we had a, a wee bit of debate earlier, uh, Jim. No debate, can we just in the third paragraph, can we make it Dumfries and Gallagher, that's in the top quartile of uh, authorities in no Dumfries. Page 41, third paragraph, doing last sentence. Dumfries is in the top quartile of authorities. That'll be Dumfries and Galloway, is it, no? Well spotted, Jim. Jane, has it another typo? Uh, no, Chairman. It's, uh, I think, a little bit um, more substantive. Um, again, we're being asked to scrutinise this policy development um, funding, and um, I want to ask about, um, firstly, um, the transparency with respect to page 43, funding, how resources would be used at the bottom of the page there, page 43. Um, this uplift would be applied, cried across the board, but would not be applied across the board, but would be informed by work currently being undertaken by the Care at Home Strategy Group. Um, now, if I was a member of the public, I would, and probably a member of the public, and indeed actually um, in the industry, I would be interested in that. I would like to be assured that there is transparency. How does the governance work with respect to, to that? Because 
that could sound to a member of the public that people would pick and choose as to who is being given money and who isn't. So I would like to know a bit about that. That's the first question. Um, and the second question um, is, um, you won't be surprised, um, I am concerned with the statements about securing commitments from independent work providers to work towards the living wage. Um, <coughs> it's on page 42. <coughs> um, and um, I, I would just again ask members um, you know, about what we can do and can't do with respect to this. Costler advice was absolutely crystal clear that you could not, um, you could not make people conform to that requirement. Um, so I would just suggest that the wording should perhaps be seeks a commitment to work towards it, as opposed to securing it. <coughs> but I'm quite willing to be advised. Matthew. In relation to the first point, Chair, uh, I, I think the, the language here is, is written perhaps a bit confusing, but is related to the fact that uh, as a council, we've got a number of different frameworks for care at home, uh, some of which are related to older people, some of which are related to adults with disabilities, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and the pressures that we're dealing with are different within each of those. The contract terms are different. So therefore, I, I think what we're trying to say here is that it won't necessarily cover everyone who gets care at home services. But I think the, the, the members are absolutely correct. And, and obviously, anything that, that we do will be informed fully by legal advice in terms of what we can and, and, and can't do. And all providers within a certain framework will be treated equally and transparently in that manner. Is that happy with that, Jane? Yeah. Uh, I am. And what about the living wage issue? I, I, I think, again, uh, Chair, the member's correct that the legal advice that we're being given at, at present says that even though we can provide a, an, an uplift to um, independent providers, we, we cannot mandate that that moves itself on, onto individuals' wages. What, what we are doing, though, is giving and, and working with the, the providers we're giving them the opportunity to, to work with us in terms of what we need to do and to help them sustain the market and, and move towards a, a, a more sustainable living wage. So it, it, it's a bit of a partnership approach, I suppose, is, is what I would say in, in the negotiation around that rather than a, a contractual item. Okay, uh, Ian Carruthers and then Richard. Thanks. I mean, that's where my question was coming from earlier, to put it into context, was in particular the living wage, because we have had legal advice before saying that we cannot do that. We actually support it. Again, my group certainly supports it. If we can actually achieve that, it would help sustain the, the, the care services out, out, out in our communities. But if we can't, do it, if we can't actually achieve that, because for legal reasons, there's 5 and 28k budgeted towards that, a degree of that, I think it's 2.5% up, which is what we're looking at. How do we see that? And that's what I would like. That's where my question was coming from. That would be one of the things on top of others. How do actually, how does that get fed back to members? Because it's quite clear within the administration's budget what you'd like to see and how it could be applied. So if we, if that goes through, which I would imagine it will uh, next Thursday, then how do we actually see that coming back? Because I think it's a very valid point what Council of Meetings brought up. Yeah. Again, I think it's uh, for the legal, ad legal, ad legal advice and. Uh, tends to be we, we follow the law rather than make the law and uh, tends to be in the, the situation so we'll take the best possible advice we can get I think is the easiest answer for you in fact it's the only answer for you um, and anything else in this appendix Jane okay. yeah well it is the administration's budget so perhaps scrutinize the administration here and ask them a question uh, why, why are you proposing this when there's no guarantee that the the money will will uh, go down to the lowest paid in, in, in the workers in Dumfries and Galloway, and and why are you proposing that when you can, there's no guarantee that the, this money is not just going to be taking its profit by the, the care companies? Uh, but is there another good reason why we're doing it apart from 
if we can't guarantee that. Uh, this is where we're, uh, we're coming into next week's uh, budget debate, I would suggest, because this is the, uh, the budget has been put forward and the officers are here to answer questions on it, not the elected members at this stage. That will happen next week at the budget setting meeting uh, or the next full council. Um, uh, Can I come back, Chair? Yeah. Uh, the, the purpose of the says in the recommendation, Chair, will to scrutinise the budget, which is at this committee, which is part of the the budget process. So it's really a question for you, as, or any other member of the administration. Uh, it's it's what, also is there a, how could we? Why are we doing this when we can't guarantee it's going to go down to the lowest paid in the area? Is there a, another benefit which will will accrue if this didn't happen? I think your point's made, Richard, and that's something you're raising as a group or on your individual when it comes to the budget setting process. But you've made your point, I think, and I don't think there's got to be a discussion on it here. Um, I, I've got uh, Jane, Willie, and then Ian Dick. <coughs> well, that's absolutely right. And um, the difficulty, as you can imagine, um, is for political groups. We're damned if we do and damned if we don't. If we don't raise it now, we'll be challenged that we didn't raise it at, at, uh, before. Um, and if, uh, <coughs> if we do here, we're told to leave it till the budget. <coughs> so I'm going to raise it anyway. Um, the, the second last bullet point on page 42. Um, I have to ask, I mean, I've never come across a more piece of Soviet speak of a planned economy is to identify funding to invest in future cost inflation uplifts for the sector. What on earth do you mean? Don't invest in future cost inflation uplifts. <coughs> it's not an investment. Capital value <coughs> of an investment uh, tends to retain, re remain roughly the same. I, 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 I would like you to explain what you mean by identify funding to invest in future cost inflation uplifts. Matthew? Yeah, um, so, sorry, I, I, I would apologise for the language there. I, I, I think within that bullet point, I think what we're trying to say is, is that within the, the sector, clearly we, we spend a significant amount of, of money. And what, what we're trying to do is, is through the Care at Home review, is use the totality of that money in a different and more effective way. So whilst we, 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 we often say that we don't want to continue to do more of the same because due to demographic pressures and other pressures, we, we, it just wouldn't be sustainable. So I think what we're trying to say there is that we, we have a, 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 an envelope of money and whilst that envelope, you know, here we can talk about increasing by a, a couple of percent, we don't always want to just think about that couple of percent. We want to think about the whole envelope and whether we can do something different with that money in order to create some sustainability within the market. Don't know if that's any clearer either. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, Chair, I think the, the, the uh, template is talking about care and support services. And there are many support services, but as uh, Jim Dempster pointed out, you know, Dumfries and Galloway is the, in the top quartile of authorities in terms of use of proportion uh, of services delivered by external uh, providers. And it does then, uh, in the, the next page in 42, recognise, you know, the, the move, and, and I hope we do, to the living wage. Uh, but Running alongside this, you know, if uh, Cameron, uh, and I refer to the UK government, is in it to, to believe, <coughs> then we could see an increase in the minimum wage, uh, which would be welcomed. Uh, so this budget is set at the current min minimum wage, which again, if that comes to fruition, which I hope it will, uh, then we could see an increase uh, again. And that increase will be felt by the external providers. So I think there is an opportunity, and, and it's more a, a point uh, uh, along the lines of Jane, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't, in raising it here. And that's to the policy development, you know, funding that could be available, and indeed the strategic fund that, that's there for us to consider of some 560 plus thousand next week. And that's to recognise, as the paper does recognise, the external providers and the need for uh, increase, and I would hope that we do recognise that 
recognise that next week in some of our day centres. I haven't had it before this committee uh, 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 and did not find uh, much support, indeed uh, no support. I would hope that we could uh, look at that next week in the 560 in terms of the external providers, particularly the day centres, and that we recognise that indeed it's been a considerable number of years since they have, and they're faced with the same uh, wage problems, uh, minimum wage, living wage, and I would hope we're moving towards it uh, in recognising an increase for the day centres. Uh, thanks, Willie. I'm, I'm sure Mr Cameron would like to have your political support. Um, <laughs> not, not my support, Chair. I just merely <laughs> say that, that you know I welcome the, 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 the £7. Right, well, Whether I trust the, 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 the Tories <laughs> is another question. Right, OK. Um, uh, Ian. OK, um, I think that's it. Can we move to the, the recommendations? OK, are we happy that we've scrutinised the detail as best we can here today? OK, thank you very much. Yeah, on that, Chairman, just to go back on the... Pro if we're agreeing this, then our role is to scrutinise the, <coughs> the details of the elements in this committee in line with the agreed bu budget development process and timetable. So if you're not going to answer the qu answer our questions or forensic questioning on it, then we're not following the process. So I'd ask again that there must be a simple reason to the, ask the simple question about why the administration was bringing forward the proposals, the policy development, and I think I think we're all entitled to a reason why you've brought forward that. I don't think it's going to be a difficult question to answer. So okay. I think we'd require Richard, an answer Richard, why hopefully, that has happened. Hopefully for, the final time, the... hopefully for the final time, Richard, this has been out for, uh, for consultation with the general public, public meetings, area committees that you have, you have had an opportunity. We've, we've discussed it here number of different fora. Um, we have, I understand it, agreed um, or, or actually carried out the scrutiny that's required as part of, of the consultation process prior to the, the, the budget setting full council meeting where this will all be d discussed, debated and decided. Right? Yep. Yeah. Gail. Chair, I entirely agree. I went through this process last year as a chairperson um, and took a lot of questions from the then opposition. And when direct questions were asked, they were answered. And that was the purpose of going through the templates. That if we required further information to inform the debate in the full council meeting, this was our opportunity to ask the question and get a rationale. And I think we've done that today, so I think we should move on. Uh, th thank you very much, yes, because um, the question that was raised from the member was actually to the administration members, not to the officers in the room. And this is about asking questions of the officers in the room right, who have actually put the paper together. We're moving on. Yep. Okay, so are we, uh, are we happy? Could I Sorry, Richard, we're moving on. Dissent on, on, on that. Well, okay, you can, you can record dissent. Yes, that's fine. Are we agreed otherwise? So you can't accept it, actually, because it's only part of the process. Well, I, I'm sure things. we can organise something. <laughs> um, um, we, could, we could note with surprise the administration is not able to explain why it's brought forward this particular policy development. I, 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 <coughs> yeah, Chairman, yeah. if I could just butt in here. You, by asking the questions, you've scrutinised the budget. You have any other questions to ask that haven't been answered fully, they can be asked out with the meeting today in advance of the budget setting on the 6th of February. So I would advise you to move to the next item. I, I would disagree because it says uh, that it's part me. of the budget excuse me, process and time table. Uh, we are, we're, not <coughs> we're not following the budget process and timetable. Uh, uh, would... Councillor, I just remind you, everything should be A through the chair. B, an outburst is not acceptable. Right? No, I'm sorry, it is not acceptable. Right? No, uh, the governor's advice is we're moving forward now and we're taking this out, uh, and we're now moving to item seven on the agenda. Yeah, yeah. On this uh, item, we've got uh, Sean Barrett and Sheila McKee. Sorry, thank you, Chair. Um, the purpose of this report today is just to, it sets out a proposed direct payment deferred payment scheme for the Greece and Galloway Council. 
and it also brings us to address a technical correction to the current practice. Um, the report um, it details different aspects in the scheme. However, the real impact is to offer um, an opportunity for people to defer payment for the care home charge, and this also increases their choice and alleviates their stress <clears throat> and their concern at the time of such a, a significant change in their life. Uh, this has been supported by an impact assessment which identified no negative impacts in relation to the proposed scheme. And thank you for any questions. Uh, thanks, Sheila. Have we any questions? I mean, this is a, um, you know, it's a technical correction that's, uh, um, that needs to be... Well, I think it was brought about by our own internal audit. Yes. It was brought about because a good practice internally that there was a um, something need to be tidied up a wee bit. I think it's the nicest way of putting it. Um, I, I, yeah, can we, Jane? Uh, I've got no, no difficulty at all with the uh, the, the proposals. I just a, a question though. Um, <clears throat> there is absolutely no mention um, of council tax. Um, in this, and, and I, I would have thought it might have been helpful, the, because it's such a detailed, um, a detailed, uh, you know, um, leaflet for the user guide on deferred payment, um, that I, I wondered whether there might have been some signposting just to he to help the the uh, the client <clears throat> at after all the very difficult time to remind them of responsibility for council tax um, or, or who they should ask because it's not it's it's not <coughs> it's not completely clear um, um, from from this uh, where they would go and ask that question um, that's question number one question number two is um, are we covered if the housing market went the wrong way um. Sean or, or uh, Sheila, which, which, which coming? I don't quite understand the first question on council tax, and it's um, can we get more details on it? We can we can follow up and see how it can be brought into the policy in relation to the housing market. The we, we the, there will be an annual review uh, looking at the persons, the equity on the house. So we would hope that any downturn we could factor that in and do a, re, a, a review again of the persons. Um, you know. Uh, the, the, they meet the criteria and they have, you know, a financial assessment uh, meets meets the criteria. We we only look for, I think it's up to 18 months to two years of equity on the house, so that would all be taken into consideration when they do the financial assessment. Um, uh, thanks, Sean. Yeah, I mean, this, this effect, it's for one specific area, isn't it? Who, who's went in? Ian? The council tax question, I was trying to understand that as well. Because I think it's a different process, Gina. I'm not sure. So it's quite a different part of the legislation, I think. Quite happy to speak to the officer afterwards and share the information with the council if he remains interested. Yeah, fine. That, that's grand. Yeah. Uh, sure. Um, are, are we quite happy to, to go to the recommendations? Uh, Jock, yeah? Just a quickie. I'm reading this charging order. So I take it a charging order can be is placed when there's a debt to collect. And the, the, the other one, deferred payment, is when somebody's in such a situation that they're unlikely to recover and they're in a care home and there's a house there and you can put a, a hold on that for deferred payment. Is that, that that's fine? Yes. Yeah. Okay, then um, we'll go straight to recommendations then. Okay, can we agree the deferred payment scheme appendix one and move it to immediate implementation to... Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're moving on to item eight, redesigning community justice system, consultation and proposals. Um, uh, we've got Alan Montefort here with us uh, to take us through this. Um, Alan, have you any update or anything you'd like to add to your report? I just wanted to identify one or two key points uh, from the report. This is the uh, um, the Scottish Government's response to the consultation that commenced in December 2012 that was reported to the committee in terms of the, the options uh, in April of last year 
uh, Scottish Government uh, after various discussions involving COSLA and also the Association of Directors of Social Work have favoured um, uh, a model that's based on the, what was option B in the original consultation, which is a, a local authority model um, with some enhancements. Um, the enhancements uh, include the, the creation uh, and statute of a, a national body that will uh, have some oversight. There was still some substantial discussion around how that will uh, move forward. Uh, key elements uh, within uh, the publication are, are clearly linked with the, the wider um, public services reforms agenda and, not surprisingly, early intervention, person-centred approaches uh, and the need for strategic leadership are identified within the report. Uh, a couple of things that um, are absent and, and leave some concern. Uh, firstly, the report makes little or no uh, comment in terms of uh, the legal obligations that are placed in local authorities to deliver uh, on the uh, orders made by courts or by the parole board, or indeed in terms of the management of Offenders Act in relation to how we assess and manage high-risk offenders. And these will be flagged up uh, within the, uh, the process that will go forward in the next while. Uh, also, within that context, in, in terms of future funding, whilst it suggested that in the uh, foreseeable future that ring fence funding of criminal justice social work services will be sustained. It, 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 the uh, part of the Community Justice Division within Scottish Government has taken that forward, the so-called Reducing Reoffending Programme to uh, the, um, the, the sequel, um, fails to mention the, the, the issues that I've said in, in relation to the statutory obligations. Uh, in terms of the way forward, it is suggesting that uh, local planning and delivery of community justice services be uh, taken through community planning partnerships and the Priest and Galloway obviously be the strategic partnership uh, through uh, some either amendment to current structures or through a new group uh, that is referred to within the document as the local community justice partnership. Uh, um, the creation of the national body, I mentioned, a focus on collaboration between local and national level uh, and mechanisms that reflect uh, the need for both national and local dem democratic responsibilities and governance. Uh, one of the things that has been suggested within the recommendations is that, uh, and I made this clear when I presented the report in April, was that community justice is not just about criminal justice social work, it's about the wider, wider context and includes some non-justice services. Uh, we've recently moved to the appointment of uh, a service manager for criminal justice social work um, that post has been funded to date within council expenditure as part of the overall uh, shifts within uh, budgets. The, the, most of that budget uh, cost will be shifted across to the criminal justice social work allocation that's received in, in grant form from the Community Justice Authority. Um, and in reflection of previous arrangements whereby uh, the percentages of service that were covered in terms of the expected legal requirements in terms of Section 27, i.e the orders of courts and parole boards, um, that uh, we sustain that within uh, the arrangements for funding of the service manager's post to ensure that uh, the 80 per cent of their work that will be the activity in, in associated with criminal justice work should be funded through the, uh, the Section 27 grant, but uh, 20 per cent of the, the allocation that's currently um, for that post from council sources be retained to reflect the non-justice demands and the community justice elements and therefore reflect uh, what's contained in the report or the, the publication from Scottish Government. We will go through an extensive consultation as how we take forward this uh, local model uh, and uh, look forward to that being developed over the next piece, but I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, Alan. Um, well, seeing there's no questions, sorry, Ian. Yeah, can I can I just ask, please, Alan, about um, in 3.17, uh, it uh, starts off with the recommendation outlined in 3.14 is accepted. Um, just reading 3.14 there, I'm not entirely sure what the recommendation contained within that paragraph is. Could you clarify that for me, please? It's the um, the recommendation that, uh, and whilst we're developing the responses. Uh, to the, the consultation, there will somebody have to uh, take that lead within uh, the local authority. Uh, if we accept that that uh, lead should be undertaken by uh, the service manager for criminal justice social work, um, the, therefore 
uh, and, and the engagement with uh, a number of parties, including uh, the, the CGA for as long as it continues, uh, and colleagues in, uh, in the three Ayrshire councils, as well as others, then we need to ensure that, that there's a capacity. Uh, I should have, uh, my apologies, it should also have uh, reflected the, the issue in terms of 3.16, in terms of the, uh, the fact that suggesting that the, the newly appointed Criminal Justice Social Work Service Manager would be the lead officer uh, in terms of the, uh, providing the advice to, uh, to council and others. So does that mean, effectively, that really should be another recommendation? No. Right, all right. right. Two point yes. four. Yeah, okay. It's agreed. Sorry, I didn't read Sorry, that properly. Confusion around the, uh, the sections in the in the report. My apologies. Okay. Um, thanks, Alan. Um, right. So, in the absence of any other questions, I'll move. So, Jane. Uh, I mean, you know, why, why are we actually setting that in stone? Why are we doing that? Um, um, 2.5, 20% of that budget. I mean, if we're going to be incredibly tight for cash, um, why, why, <coughs> why are we stating that at this stage? Alan, can you pick that up? It is not possible within the scrutiny attached to the, the allocation from the Criminal Justice Social Work Grant in terms of the activities of officers within Criminal Justice Social Work Services uh, to see them undertaking work that goes out with the uh, the legal requirements for the delivery of criminal justice social work. And as I was saying earlier, this is a, a wider agenda in terms of community justice that requires uh, the officers within the council to uh, take into account the wider context and to ensure that that's properly reflected as we move forward. Uh, the current uh, arrangements uh, in, within the current structures are, are for 100% of the, uh, the service manager's cost to be met by the council. Uh, the suggestion I'm, I'm actually making is that the 80% is transferred across to uh, the Criminal Justice Social Work Grant, uh, but 20% of the funding uh, is continued by the Council uh, from Council Social Work Budgets to ensure that we uh, continue to have the wider perspective of community justice represented and the officers the capacity to do so. Uh, and we are not subject to uh, criticisms from the auditors in terms of use of the Section 27 grant. Um, uh, yeah, Alan, just to let you back in, Jen. This is us going back to the old 8020 funding situation, isn't it? So that we actually have some input from the head of criminal justice. Because if they were 100% funded from the Section 27 grant, we would have no call on their time other than the re-offending. The re it's correct. There's, there's historically, since the ring fence funding was introduced in the early 90s, uh, that there's been a, a division. Uh, it was, as, council, as the chair refers to, 8020, and this e has existed and pertained. We have uh, uh, currently two other staff who are funded 8020 to allow them to undertake criminal justice social work duties and duties as mental health officers, uh, because the mental health officer part of their, their job is not covered by the Section 27 allocation. So it's a budget saving in terms that we're using the grant to fund 80% of the post. And instead of being a whole hundred percent from the social work budget, it's now twenty percent from the social work budget. Is that simple terms, yeah? Thank you, Alan. Okay then. Um, all right. <laughs> um, okay then. Can we move on to the recommendations then? Uh, Two point one. We're happy to note. Two point two. Note. Two point three. Note. Two point four. Agree. Thank you. Um, 2.5, agreed. Okay, now we'll move on to the item 9. Thank you very much. Um, uh, sustainable management structure, uh, an update. Um, as we all know, this was deferred um, from the last social work committee. Um, in the report, I'm not prejudged, but predetermined what the officers are going to say. Um, partly the recommendations of Pricewaterhouse Cooper, um, and also the needs for integration are 
address, have been addressed here. Um, we need to focus, I would suggest, um, on getting the most senior level of management uh, organised so that we can then go into the detailed work which will naturally follow from that. Um, so, Peter or, or Paul, have you anything you'd like to add to your report or any brief summary? Fly away, Peter. Fly away, Paul. <laughs> um, yes, Chair. I mean, it's been a long time in the making this. There's been a, an awful lot of um, soul searching and consideration gone into it about what, what would be the um, most appropriate structure looking ahead to um, particularly um, the integration with adult care and also um, in anticipation of um, child care legislation and the GERFIC agenda. What we um, were very keen to do in the structure was maintain or in fact strengthen um, strategic leadership um, within the department whilst not losing the focus on area and localities. So what we've, what we've, um, or what we're presenting to you this morning is a structure that um, has very clear um, chief officers at the top that are specialist officers, one for children, families and criminal justice, one for adult care and one for resources. That that, um, and I appreciate that we're, we're not looking at the detail of the structure below that, but that those chief officers would manage specialist teams um, that would each have strong um, focuses and management teams in the four localities. I think as a general introduction, that's it. I mean, the, the papers have been with people for some time and I'm aware of have been subject to quite detailed discussions. So, um, really, I'll just um, throw out to questions. Uh, thanks, Peter. Richard? Okay, I agree that it's been an arduous process to reach this stage. Right, the only co concern is that who is going to be, uh, who's going to be ensuring corporate working between the, the different uh, service heads, who's going to ensure equity of budget, uh, who's going to be monitoring the overall control of the monitoring of the of the service. If uh, there's going to be a person, then they should be shown in the, the structure, I think, to make it workable. I, I, I think there's two levels to that. One, um, we're introducing or we're recommending the introduction of a head of resources. That person would have um, responsibility for ensuring that any strategic plans were realistic in terms of, of, of finance and that um, proposals in terms of direction of travel and particular policies um, were realistic in terms of money available. Um, and that's been something that um, has, has, I think, been a, a weakness in social work for some time. In terms of partnership working and in terms of ensuring that there's um, cooperation and balance between the, the third sector and the various public sectors, that's the role and responsibility of the Chief Social Work Officer who would report to the Chief Executive. That person um, would also have a line management responsibility for um, the um, Head of Resources and a governance stroke line management responsibility for the head of adults. I, I say governance stroke um, line management because there are certain statutory functions, um, mental health in particular, that have to be um, directly line managed by the council um, and the um, public protection agenda for both children, vulnerable adults and elderly people. So there will be um, clear lines of accountability and responsibility, both in terms of um, corporate working and in terms of partnership working um, with the third sector and other public bodies. Thanks, Peter. Jane. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Richard's touched on it. Uh, look, I, I've got absolutely no difficulty with um, the, the proposals here um, I, I think the head of resources um, position is is really sensible. I think the connection of head of children, families, and criminal justice is a really sensible 
um, uh, putting together uh, adult services because of the integration. It all it all makes perfect sense in terms of understanding um, the the specialisms and giving people responsibility a clear definition that that if you're looking at adult mental health issues then they are they are the chief officer that that that's that's not difficult and that's actually very helpful in many ways um what what i think is more difficult um to to believe is in some ways um the bit that comes below um and you know while i accept that we're not dealing directly with that it will have a it will have an effect and i i think we should start at the beginning um, because um we get i go back to the savings proposal um which talks about people have to work in a different way um and here we're talking about changes of management um how am i going to know that that we're not going to get the problem of 13 people in a room none of whom is prepared to take a decision for a family over a child uh, you know how is that how is that particular thing that happens now going to stop how are we going to be able to say it is your responsibility to 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 say what is happening in that particular case i think i think that's what needs to to be clear that the danger is that at the moment that um the perception of the public is that they get into a um a, a case with with their child, with their um, elderly relative, whatever's happening, uh, and they don't feel that there's anybody who's capable of taking a decision at that particular level. So I I'm, I'm really saying this is fine. I think I see how this is going to work, and I, I applaud this. I think this is absolutely right. But I want to be shown at the same time how we are going to manage this particular problem, um, which has manifested itself currently how are we going to make certain that that level of i suppose refusal to take responsibility or inability to take responsibility um <coughs> is 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 managed out of the system Peter, yeah. a, a structure will facilitate good practice um it won't ensure good practice um a structure also has to have a certain culture that um, goes with it, and it's whether this structure promotes that culture. Um, we have a strategy um, that requires us to work close to people in their local communities. We have a, a direction of travel that requires us to um, enable people to make decisions about their own lives. Um, we have a, a, a stated intent to involve people actively in the planning of their lives. That will only be achieved if frontline social workers are given the authority and the, um, I don't like the word autonomy, I much prefer delegated discretion, but autonomy is the word that's used. Um, autonomy within accountability. Now the 21st Century Review actually um, talks about all frontline staff being leaders of service. It talks about um, organisations requiring those social workers who are now qualified professionals who undergo four years training um, to be able to make decisions. Um, what we've, we've got at the present time is a structure that hasn't facilitated that. Um, we have a structure that, that's been based on a culture of upward delegation where people have not been empowered and enabled to make decisions at the front line. So what, what we actually need are senior social workers managing teams of social workers that feel confident and supported to make professional decisions uh, and to stop having endless meetings and to stop. Um, I, mean, I often say to people, you do not get a collective meeting um, in respect of a child. A person makes a decision in respect of a child and what a meeting is about is how people contribute and how the different roles and agencies make their respective decisions. Social workers have to make decisions, as do health. And so planning meetings are about how those decisions are coordinated. So what I would like to see, my ambition for this structure, is that we will have strong locality teams, each 
I mean, if I talk about children and families, um, each locality will have a service manager that will be working very, very closely with other agencies, will have a senior social worker managing a team of social workers. Those social workers should then be able to get on and do their job. I think at the moment the structure, because um, there's been an inbuilt confusion about the strategic planning and the tactical delivery and the operational management hasn't facilitated that. Thanks, Peter. Um, I've, I've got two people wanting in here. I, I, um, I've got Gail and then Willie and Richard after that. Yeah, sorry, I've got three people. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, I'm going to be a wee bit critical, and I know that you're not going to do anything about it, but I'm going to make my comments anyway. <laughs> I think we have a wage structure in this department that is not, that is far higher than other departments um, for comparable levels of work, for instance, in education. I suspect that we've got people who are on the second tier being paid more than our director of education. And I just wonder if we've got a historic um, high wage within this department <coughs> that is not reflected within other departments. As I say, just looking at the salary grades for the responsibility that is not dissimilar to other departments. You can laugh all you like. I don't know what that does for morale in other departments. Um, and I know that we have heads of service in other departments who are on far less wages than is proposed in here. I've made my comment. I don't even need you to respond. Uh, well, I, yeah, if I'd known it was just going to be a comment, I would have stopped you because it's obvious that they've been through a job evaluation system and, and that's where they come. And uh, you're the first, as the ex-head of, uh, uh, sorry, chair of education, uh, <laughs> Uh, we've all too often in the past actually had it the other way around. The education have had higher wages than everyone else, but we'll not go there, eh? Um, uh, Willie and then Rich. Yeah, Chair, the, the, the report <coughs> is headed Social Work Services Sustainable Management Structure, and, and, and then it's our update. Now, yeah, I, I'm not really too fussed as to whether you, you call the individual a director or, or a chief social worker. What I'm more concerned with is what Peter's talking about. It's the culture of delivery uh, at uh, the, the, the coal face. And what I'm looking for is a structure that will deliver this to the, the maximum uh, performance and efficiency. Uh, and it's to where a culture of can do uh, and reflected in that would be that you give people clear uh, outcomes, uh, you know, as to what services we can deliver, that there is a timeline associated with that. My experience has been that in social work that you never seem to know when it's all going to be delivered, far less does the service user, uh, and that that uh, outcome uh, and timeline is delivered timorously. Uh, I was referred to this morning to an acronym in, in, in SMART, and, and I've forgotten what it actually means now. But it seemed to, 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 to strike a chord in terms of how we deliver. Now, Willa... Hey, Willie, have you got a question in this? Chair, I, I, I take it you're chairing the meeting, yeah. But, but no, I yeah, didn't I, 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 and I, I haven't heard you ask the, anyone this morning. My point is... Well, I did actually. My, I've asked more than one. And I'm asking, is there a question? Is not well, a I'm still within the, 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 the standing orders unless you tell me different that I'm allowed to speak to you. So, so allow me to continue, please. So um, we just, just my, well, well, allow me can, to continue within standing can, orders, Chair. Can you just hold on a second? I, is there a question for the officer? I will come the to the question, Chair. Can we come to the question, then, please? Yeah. Yeah, and I'll come to it within the standing orders, if you don't mind. And, 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 and if well, in actual fact, we start, you're, you're past your time. Most, it's, I'm actually allowed you more time than you yeah, had. Well, I, I didn't see you look your clock, right. so I'll come to my okay, question, Chair. I'm, I'm not Chair. involved in a tit that with you because it's just not worth Jesus it, this, part, this is far too serious for this nonsense. Can I come right. to you? So can I be allowed, Chair? The question, I'll come please. to my question. Now, what I've asked is that, that, that we, we be allowed, and what I'm asking in the structure, and Peter's alluded to it, uh, in terms of uh, autonomy to, to social workers at that level, that this structure being presented just now, will it be able to increase on the, uh, the, the, the performance and efficiencies uh, so that the people who are receiving the service receive the, 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 the service that they require uh, 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 and need? Okay. Uh, Sean, can you take that, please? Yeah. Uh, Councillor, I suppose the simple question is, is yes. Like, if you look at the structure, 
The structure is about a sustainable, as you said, a sustainable management structure. It is not looking a, at so we're not going doing away with any front line social work post. So what we're trying to do is is build a social work department from the bottom up that is going to be fit to meet the, cha the, the challenges of the children, young persons bill, public bodies bill, and everything else I've heard me say in the past. So, yes. Th th thank you, uh, Richard. You got a question? Yeah, thinking of what Peter said earlier on, on my last question, uh, I think for clarification, he said that the head of service resources would be the his line manager or her line manager would be the head of service adult services. So, the, uh, no, that's not what he said. That's what I thought he said. No, the chief social work officer. So, you the head of service resources will be line managed by. The Chief yeah. Social Work Officer. Because the, the, if not, you remember, if you look in your papers, the Chief Social Work Officer role is very clear and has an overview and uh, on, on practice and training and everything else. For, well, it's, right. it's not in this diagram, is it? <coughs> it? It's actually in the roles. It was in the appendix that actually said, when there is no papers, actually what the roles were of the Chief Social Work Officer. They were there, Richard. Can't see this. No. Okay, can we move on? Anyone else? Okay. Jane? Um, I, uh, I have been neglectful. I've not gone back to the Pricewaterhouse Review, and I should have, I know. Um, but uh, staff, I know, have talked about um, wanting um, people to be visible. Uh, in terms of leadership, how are we going to uh, be certain that this will provide an enhanced visibility? I mean, I have to say, in an area like Dumfries and Galloway, um, I think there has to be an element of realism in all of this. You cannot expect people to run around popping up all the time and being visible, but I, I presume that there must be ways of doing this. <laughs> so I'd like to know how this will enhance that particular problem that's been highlighted by staff. I, I, I think sometimes, um, Chair and uh, Councillor, when people talk about visibility, they're actually um, alluding to whether or not they're listened to, um, not whether or not they're being able to look at somebody. Um, and I think um, the, the ambition um, about this structure, and the thing I find attractive about it personally, is that it will specialise and it will have... Um, a senior professional chief officer who knows his or her business about adult care and is able to manage a tier of service managers that know their business in localities who meet as a team um, and who tie together the overall strategic direction of the authority with what's going on in each of their localities. And the same will apply um, in children and families and criminal justice. And what will tie all of that together is the head of resources. And uh, Councillor Scobie was asking there um, about essentially performance and how we know that we're succeeding. And uh, that head of resources will also have a quality assurance role and a performance management role. Um, and one of the things that um, that person will be responsible for doing is ensuring that not only is a business plan at a high level, but that those business plans actually relate to particular service areas. Um, because a, um, and we need to actually go down and ask what is important for service users? What is important for that mother um, whose child she has concerns about? And we need to translate that into measures. So I think what, what this will do, a head of adult services is not going to be able to, to transport themselves from Stramra to Langham. Um, but what that head of service ought to be able to do is that each person that's working in adult care knows what the agenda is, knows where they're going, knows that there are regular meetings going on, that they participate in those regular meetings, and they're all signed up to the agenda. And I think that's what's been missing. So I think when people talk about visibility, they've been talking about something else. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Brian. Thanks, Chair. Just going to page 113 of 120, I'm glad to see that Paul's here. 
it seems to me that the recruitment and selection process is rather lengthy and I wonder if it's necessary that it take that uh, span of time to go through this process or if it might be shortened. Thank you. Paul? The span of time for the recruitment process has been tightened as far as we possibly can and the big influence on that is the Council's diary. Uh, we've actually taken a lot less time for the elements that we actually have to discharge under the process so that it does actually take place within that time frame and it's actually the Council's diary that's, that's lengthening that process. We can do some of the Council diary, we can do some of the deadlines. Um, uh, Barry, you, you okay? <laughs> um, I, I think a, 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 a kind of reasonable question that was a, a two signs you know, let you in um, is, the, is the second box um, a whole month to advertise I mean does that really have to be a full month um, I mean is there, is there some statutory thing we have to do or is it is that just a norm we're allowing an extended period of time for that to actually make sure that we, we are highlighting that and it's actually the time of year that we're doing it that's influenced that extended period of time. We're mindful of that. We're actually doing quite expensive and extensive um, circulation of, of the jobs and given that it's three very key posts for social work services, it's imperative we allow sufficient time at that end. Okay, Ian. Now, just a point on, on the council diary. Um, uh, I, I would have thought that the, um, the, the pro that it's prioritised. In other words, if something as important as this comes in, the other thing, uh, other items may very well need to be um, displaced or moved. Um, because I think I think this is a particularly important uh, process and appointment. Um, and should it not be the case that when you do have something there that uh, requires priority, that we uh, look at uh, rejigging the diary? Uh, uh, Ian? I think, because I've been through this process many times, I think it's very important that we get it right. And it's, that's what we should emphasise, is we get this right, we get the right people in place. I think this is the right structure. So, on a personal level, I can see there is quite a, a lengthy time, but I've not really got any qualms with that. Uh, okay, I'm happy with your, with your answer, Paul, on, on the question about the month for the advertising. Um, but I'm also um, uh, aware and a wee bit concerned that Council diaries uh, can be altered or shifted to meet, um, how can I put this, say the clock's ticking in integration and the quicker we get it into place the better I would suggest. So can we maybe amend um, uh, when we come to the recommendations to actually, as, or, or earlier, if council diaries can be adjusted or something down those lines, because that would actually take into account and actually show people what we mean business here that, and we think this something needs to be done relatively quickly. Um, any other members? Jane? Um, I just want to be absolutely sure that there is, with the head of resources, um, uh, who are going to be um, in charge of all the things that they are going to be, and, and I 100% <coughs> um, uh, feel that's right. How is this going to square with um, the arrangement we've got at the moment with finance officers being line managed in finance? Is that going to stay? Because I think it should. I, I think that's, part, that's the next part of the process, Jane, with, uh, with respect. And uh, if you actually see the council papers for next week, they start to put the person specs in for the, four, for the three posts. Um, I, because after this discussion today, obviously it goes to, uh, goes to full council. Because obviously we can't move the uh, advertiser appoint uh, chief officers. That requires full council. So um, suggest part of that is, uh, is covered in the person specs attached to the report for next week. And I think would also be um, would, would quite naturally come about as we actually start to build the three the three pillars of the new social work service. Uh, because obviously, um, as you know, the, the, um, you've got the integration board. You've, we've got joint working just now between health and um, health uh, finance team and the uh, local authority finance team, which is currently ongoing. So it's a case of we're building from the bottom here up the way, and we're building from the top down the way, and the two should meet in the middle like a decent bridge. Um, okay, Peter. Peter, did you want? Well, it, it was just a general comment, Chair. Really, that um, point. 
posts of this importance, if, if you want to attract a high caliber of person, you don't look as though you're panicking into rushing recruitments. And it is pretty standard um, to have a month's recruitment period. Um, and it's also um, for, for officer, uh, for appointments of, of, of this level to have um, fairly rigorous assessments and to have, um, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is that as a local authority, we have to demonstrate a degree of professionalism in the recruitment process, quite apart from um, the council diaries. And excuse me um, if I, if I'm out of order for saying that, Chair, but I, I just felt that it needed to be said. Hey, thank, thanks, Peter. Uh, is anyone else wanting to speak at this stage? Um, uh, um, we'll, we'll just move the recommendations in. We've obviously com uh, considered the report and, and the recommendations. Um, we can we note the comments raised um, at 2.2. And the detailed responses at 3.3. Um, under 2.3, we note the revised outline steps and timetable to progress the recommendations set out in Annex B. Jane. Sorry. Chairman, Chairman, you whizzed over 2.2, .2 and I wanted to talk about 2.2. .2. No, no, it's the report and recommendations. Yeah. Yeah, because we, we've agreed at 2.1, we've agreed, we consider the report and the recommendations, and we've agreed it. Yeah. 2.2, .2. so you, you've agreed that appendix? Well, I hope you no, know what no, it means. No, Annex A, that's what we, that was 2.1, we agreed it. Appendix 6A, well, I'm sorry, Chairman, I hope you know what you've done, because I said well, no, 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 at, at, at Annex A, Jane. I'm looking at Appendix 6A. Yes. Chairman, I think the confusing thing about that, but it is clear if you look at it closely, is that the Head of Children, Families and Criminal Justice Services and the Chief Social Work Officer are embedded at the same post. They, if they'd been sitting a tier higher, it maybe would, would have been more obvious, but that is the highest level. They're not on the same level as the other three posts. It is confusing. They should maybe be sitting a tier higher in the block diagram, but that person is the is the one a couple of person from my understanding. It. Well, okay, let's let's just be careful here because we're talking about three pillars here. We're talking about three service areas. Forget the people who are actually inside the box. It's the boxes we're agreeing, right? And we're then moving uh, because one of the posts, uh, i.e., the one or oh, um, children's services, actually carries the added responsibility of being the chief social work officer. And again, if you read when the papers at full council, that's actually reflected in, in, in the report that goes forward. Right? So it's actually right. And the, the strategic planning and commissioning post is 50% funded by the NHS. It is not part of, technically part of, of what we are discussing here today. We are discussing adult care, children and, and, and criminal justice, right? and the new business side or, or, or resources side. So it's just, it's actually quite straightforward, and we're overcomplicating this. So the agreement we need today is to move this to full council next week, to agree with full council next week, so that we can actually put the process in place right, to appoint three chief officers. That's all we need to agree today. Right. Can we agree that? Agreed. Thank you. Right. Um, we'll move on to item 10. Thanks very much, Peter and uh, Paul. Um, No, there's no um, okay, appointment outside bodies uh, area support team, uh, the, the old children's panel. Are you taking it? Yeah. Or can you? I mean, the, the, the present incumbents are myself, Yen, and Richard. Um, I'm, uh, we obviously need uh, <laughs> three people here to go forward. I'm happy to stand aside. We're, I think we just appoint three, 
reappoint from here today. That seems to be the simple, easiest way to do this. So have we got any nominations or, or things? Jock? I'll not nominate John Syme to take over a spare seat, Chair. Happy to second, Chair. Okay. Are you comfortable with that, John? I'm happy to take that on, John. Go on, I think. Okay, I'll, I'm happy to second that. Propose Yen. John Martin proposing Yen. Yen, are you? Happy to accept. Thank you. Um, uh, Ian I'll Carruso. second that if we need to second Well, you know, Ian Carruso has done it, yep. So we've got the three. So it's John, Richard, Yen. Okay? Thanks very much. Is there anything else? Was this quick? Hmm? Yeah, yeah. Um, right, we move on to um, item 11. Uh, we need to agree to ask the members of the public to leave the room uh, to go into private session. We agreed? Just the room. Uh, just, uh, yeah. Sorry? Uh, item 12, sorry. Beg your pardon. 